pleasure to be here today. Um, I am a writer, but I'm also a mother and a citizen of the earth. And that is really what impelled me to write this book. As Patrick has pointed out, three quarters of our electricity comes from fossil fuels, and our per capita carbon emissions are among the highest in the world. So we have a responsibility starting at home here in the US. In other parts of the world, people don't have electricity. Nearly two billion people somehow get along without it. Their average lifespan is 43 years. In several of these countries, they're building new power plants. India, China, and Brazil are expected to hugely increase the amount of nuclear power in worldwide in the coming years, for example. So we need to think about what are the risks and benefits of nuclear power, really? And that was the journey I made through the nuclear world, was com to compare risks and benefits and learn what they were, because I started out assuming that there were many risks and few benefits. I, one of the things I learned along the way is electricity is miraculous. With electricity, you can have clean water. So the lifespan in a country with even where people just get a few watts per capita goes up. Uh, they have clean water, they have better health care, and so on. In villages where uh, girls have to go walk 10 miles to fetch water or pick up twigs, if there's electricity from a solar pump or a windmill, they can stay in the village and go to school. And that changes everything. They begin to have smaller families and so on. When people live longer, they reduce the number of children they have. They're healthier, they're more productive. It's really a good thing. So electricity, uh, some people say, well, we should just have less electricity. Uh, and I have talked to environmentalists who actually do say things like that. For humanitarian reasons, we have to have it. In this country, uh, there has been a shift in it. Just at, while I was writing the book, I started writing it around, I started it as an article in 1999, and in, by about 2004, 2005, I began, uh, I think it was around then that I began hearing about people like Patrick and uh, Stuart Brand or James Lovelock. Some of them had been talking about nuclear power before that, but I just, that's about the time I learned that other people who had been opposed to nuclear power were, were beginning to think like, I was beginning to think, coming at it from another direction. So polls uh, also, because of uh, global warming and fears about it, have shifted the, the uh, approval rating of nuclear power recently. And um, I, I was interested to hear in the Nevada debate with uh, Obama, Edwards, and Clinton that Obama said, if we're going to deal with global warming we, and climate change, we have to have nuclear power. It's essential. That did not seem to lessen his popularity in the progressive side of the Democratic Party at all. So people also worry about imported fossil fuels, um, lack of energy independence, those deadly foreign entanglements that we get involved in uh, by importing a lot of our fuel, oil, and natural gas. People are very unhappy with the price at the pump. And uh, there's just a huge interest now in electric forms of transportation, as Patrick has pointed out. Well, these are privileges of a wealthy part of the world. Uh, buying a Prius is not an option in a lot of places. So they're going to be likely to build more coal-fired plants. So what we need to do is at least in the uh, industrialized world is to lower our emissions dramatically. And we have till about 2040 to get these alternatives in place. And we need all of them, renewables and nuclear, to replace fossil fuels. Every year, there's a, a net increase of three to four billion tons of carbon dioxide due to human activity 
power plants, cement plants, land use. Those are the greatest emitters. The CO2, as you know, is trapping heat in the atmosphere. But there's another thing going on. Um, it's altering the chemistry of the ocean quite dramatically. So this risk, we know about the risks of rising temperature, but the risk of the acidification of the ocean, it's not speculative. It's going on right now. Marine biologists are finding that the effects of acidification on corals and other shellfish, fish with, with exoskeletons made of calcium carbonate, the acidity that is formed in the, the acidity in the ocean comes from carbonic acid. When the, the ocean is the world's biggest carbon sink, it takes up carbon dioxide. It's been doing a wonderful job for many millions of years doing this. But in the past century or so, the balance is tipping between acidity and alkalinity. Before sediments would wash into the ocean frequently enough from weathering to keep, keep the balance. But now the acidic level is so high that the creatures that have evolved in the ocean in the past 400,000 years have been used to an alkaline ocean. And they've been used to making their shells out of calcium carbonate. The amount of calcium carbonate in the water is reducing. And that's because of us. We are doing that to the ocean. The food chain is going to be affected. At least a billion people depend on the ocean in some way or other for food. It will have impacts on the land, especially uh, the impacts are big along the uh, continental shelves where the, there's more acidity uh, going on because of the water mixing more with the carbon dioxide. So that's a pretty big risk. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has made several recommendations about what to do to at least mitigate this disaster in any way we can. And one of those recommendations includes nuclear power. Worldwide, 440 reactors or so avoid 2 billion metric tons of CO2 a year. In the, and since 1965, nuclear and hydro have each avoided 100 million tons of carbon dioxide emissions. In other words, if there hadn't been any hydroelectric working and there hadn't been any nuclear reactors working, there would be 200 billion tons more of uh, CO2 in the atmosphere today. So we would be a lot further along in this crisis. As Patrick has pointed out, in real world terms, we only have, in this country, two sources of baseload energy, electricity, fossil fuels and nuclear. Wind and solar provide less than 1% to the grid. They're growing, that's good. But uh, to ramp them up enough to replace fossil fuels would constitute a tremendous invasion of the landscape, tremendous invasion of open land. People like to think of deserts as empty, lifeless places. Uh, I'm from New Mexico. And uh, I know that deserts are not empty and lifeless at all. There's a lot going on in there. <coughs> and from the microorganisms in the soil that are sequestering carbon to the plant life and animal life. So just carpeting the desert with uh, solar panels and piping that energy <coughs> long distances to cities uh, seems to me like a very bad idea. <coughs> 